And thank you, Dr. Day, for giving me the privilege to speak with you today. Can you hear me all right? Okay. So uh, first, I just want to I want to thank Dr. Day for his incredible effort for uh, holding these meetings. This is the fourth one for raising awareness about myotonic dystrophy and for promoting, uh, first of all, for, for promoting education, research, uh, and advocacy for myotonic dystrophy, but as well as connecting patients. And I really feel honored to be a part of this uh, today. So I'd like to give you a brief clinical overview. Some of you may have heard some of this already, but I'm going uh, to try uh, to, I'm going to try to answer these questions. If I, Sabrina, are you here? It won't advance. Oh, it is advancing. Okay. It's not advancing on my screen. Huh. Whoa. Uh, excuse me, technical difficulty. Can you come up here? <laughs> so I'll just start. I'd like to answer these questions. First of all, how can I explain myotonic dystrophy to my friends and family? What causes myotonic dystrophy? What is the pathogenesis? And why is each person with myotonic dystrophy different? Why are some people affected earlier in life with more severe symptoms? And then lastly, I'd like to talk about doctor visits. Sabrina, the screen. No, it's, it's off. This way out. <laughs> uh, thank you. What should we talk about at the doctor visits? When I go to my clinic visit, what are the appropriate things to ask? Um, and am I getting the appropriate treatment? What other checkups should I be having? So that's what I'm hoping to cover today. I'm going to try to do this. One second. Let's see if it's any better. No, it's still over there. One moment. Well, I'll keep on talking. So if someone was to ask you, what is muscular dystrophy? Uh, the answer would be, muscular dystrophy is not one condition, but it's a group of inherited conditions. And myotonic dystrophy is one type of muscular dystrophy. And it's probably the most common adult form of muscular dystrophy. Uh, how are we doing? Keep on your notes. I don't need my notes. I can just, we, we can do without notes. Okay, perfect. Yeah, okay. Got it. All right. And in muscular dystrophy, what happens is there's a, a degeneration of muscle, which causes progressive uh, weakness. And uh, in myotonic dystrophy, which I said is the most common form of muscular dystrophy, it doesn't just involve uh, muscles, but it involves other systems. And we're going to talk about some of those major systems, including the heart the eyes, as well as the brain. Uh, the words myotonic and dystrophy come from the words myotonia, myo meaning muscle, and tonia meaning tone or tension. And dystrophy means a degeneration with shrinkage of muscle fibers. And if someone experiences a clinical myotonia, uh, what it means is they're having a, a delay when after contracting a muscle, there's a delay in relaxation. So what that uh, would mean is if you make a tight fist, this is an example, you're contracting your fingers. When you try to relax, it would be a delay, a very slow relaxation. And clinical myotonia is not just limited to the hand or fist, but it can occur in the tongue, in the jaw, in the toes, or in the back, and uh, in any muscles that are affected. As you may know, there are two different types of myotonic dystrophy and they've been abbreviated with the uh, Latin name dystrophica myotonia. Uh, there's type 1 DM1 from that abbreviation DM and type 2 DM2. And I'm going to talk about the core features of both, but the one thing that really uh, distinguishes the two is type 2 is less common and it does not have a childhood form where myotonic dystrophy type 1 can present uh, at birth as well as in childhood. So in about 1909, a doctor in Germany, uh, Dr. Steinert, described uh, some families that had 
uh, weakness in a specific distribution along with the myotonia. And it wasn't until about 1992 that a gene was discovered associated with that, with that syndrome, and this was on the dystrophia myotonica protein kinase gene, the DMPK gene. Uh, and uh, this was called Steiner syndrome or myotonic dystrophy. Around uh, 1992, another syndrome uh, was described, a similar disorder. Patients had weakness in a little different distribution, more hips and shoulders. It was called proximal uh, muscular uh, myotonic, excuse me, proximal muscular dystrophy. And they also had myo myotonia, but they did not have the genetic mutation on the DMPK gene. So uh, with more work, a gene was discovered in about 2001 that was responsible for this second type of syndrome with myotonia having proximal distribution. And one of the discoverers of this uh, mutation on the zinc finger 9 gene, now called the cellular, cellular nucleic uh, binding protein gene, was Dr. Day. He was one of the discoverers of the uh, the gene. And so then after this gene was discovered, the nomenclature changed a bit. Myotonic dystrophy uh, was either described as type 1 associated with the DMPK gene mutation and then DM2, the proximal form associated with the, uh, the other mutation on a different uh, chromosome. So myotonic dystrophy type 1, the more common form, uh, can present is in at birth as well as in childhood or in adulthood. And those who are born with it, meaning congenital, this is the most severe form. These babies are born usually very floppy, they're very sick, they have difficulty breathing, as well as difficulty feeding primarily from their facial weakness. Uh, they often may have club foot as well or, and other skeletal abnormalities. If they make it through the neonatal period, they usually stabilize, can walk, although their motor milestones may be somewhat delayed and they have intellectual disability. Uh, children who present with myotonic dystrophy often come to attention not because of weakness, but because of difficulty at school with learning or with attention or behavior issues. And when examined, they may have uh, significant facial weakness, decreased facial expression, difficulty with speaking, but very mild limb weakness. Uh, the classic adult form uh, usually presents in the teens to the 30s, although it's not often recognized at the time of uh, symptoms, but the diagnosis might be somewhat delayed. And they may have mild myotonia, have some finger, uh, long finger flexion weakness, which is responsible for gripping, and can affect your handwriting. And this weakness uh, can progress at different rates, and within the same family, the weakness can progress at, at different rates. Uh, the distribution of weakness is shown on this uh, picture in red. And just starting from the top, uh, the um, muscles of the face can be involved, the muscles around the temporal bones as well as around the jaw. And when these become a, uh, atrophic, there can be some hollowing out of those muscles. The eyelids can become affected as well as the neck, which is responsible for posture and holding our head up. Uh, the muscle in the middle of the chest there is the diaphragm, which is very important for breathing. And when that becomes weak, uh, you can have shortness of breath, which is especially uh, noted when you're lying flat or lying down. Uh, in addition, the limbs can be affected and it has what we call a distal distribution, meaning the most distant muscles, those in the forearms and hands, uh, affecting handwriting, gripping, pinching, and then the distal legs, meaning lower legs and feet, and this can result in foot drop when one has trouble clearing their toes and you might trip because you're catching your toes and to compensate, one might lift up their knees high so that they can clear the ground. So DM2, myotonic dystrophy type 2, less common, has a much different presentation and does not present uh, in childhood, usually presenting as an adult. And they can have any one of these symptoms. If they do have weakness, it's usually proximal, more shoulders and hip girdle rather than hands and feet. Or they may present with muscle cramps or pain, or they may present with fatigue. And in fact, some of these patients don't have any of these symptoms. They might just have an elevated CPK. And we believe that uh, 
Myotonic dystrophy type 2 is probably under-recognized just because the syndrome is not as clear-cut. They have myotonia and then one of perhaps one of the clinical symptoms or just an elevated CPK. And to date, there are no known congenital cases of myotonic dystrophy type 2. As mentioned, the weakness is primarily proximal. Uh, in the shoulder girdles, if there's weakness, you might have difficulty reaching up high above your head. And hips, and hips are involved, and this would involve muscles that help you climb stairs or get out of a low chair, out of the car. Now the neck and long finger flexors can be involved, but not to the same degree as in myotonic dystrophy type 1. And what's also been noted is some of these patients have large calves and a fine tremor. So myotonic dystrophy, as I said, is not just a muscle disease. It's multi-system. Besides having myotonia and weakness, it can involve, involve other systems such as the heart, the eyes, your breathing, endocrine system, uh, GI, your hair and skin. There can be frontal balding. Some patients have immune regularities, irregularities as well as central nervous system involvement. And I'm going to talk about some of the major systems involved. As far as the heart, uh, the major problem with uh, uh, the heart in myotonic dystrophy is usually an abnormal heart rhythm, either going too slow, bradycardia, or in some cases going too fast, an atrial fibrillation, atrial flutter. And some patients don't have any symptoms when they have too slow or too fast um, heartbeat. And that's why it's so important to make sure that you have a regular EKG and are seeing a cardiologist. And uh, often, if you do have symptoms, they might not be chest pain, as you would think of in, in cardiac, uh, but it could be dizziness, lightheadedness, or even fainting. And that could be an indication that you have an abnormal heart rhythm. And in later stages, one can develop a weakened heart muscle, which we call a cardiomyopathy. Breathing can be involved in myotonic dystrophy, and it's, the lungs are actually normal, but it's because the muscles of breathing uh, can weaken, and that's especially noted during sleep. Uh, this can lead to ex uh, excessive daytime sleepiness, falling asleep very easily, needing to sleep more, as well as sleep disorders such as apnea, and apnea means uh, when you stop breathing briefly, and this can be due uh, to an obstruction in the airway, or it can be a central uh, apnea when the brain has decreased uh, drive to breathe during sleep. The eyes can be affected with cataracts, which is a cloudy, cloudiness or opaque film um, over the lenses of the eyes, which uh, need to be removed to, so that you uh, don't impair vision. And this occurs earlier than in, uh, with normal aging, usually before age 50. Uh, the GI system can be involved in many patients uh, with difficulty swallowing, which we're going to hear about later on. Uh, there can be problems with motility, leading to constipation, diarrhea, as well as problems with the gallbladder, because there, uh, as there is an ri increased risk of gallstones in patients uh, with myotonic dystrophy. The endocrine glands can be involved, and uh, our endocrine glands release hormones, which are chemicals that regulate behavior uh, as well as different functions. Uh, many patients with myotonic dystrophy have insulin resistance, which can predispose you to diabetes. Uh, two glands in the neck uh, can be involved. The thyroid gland is involved in metabolism, and if you have low thyroid, um, you can feel very tired, you can feel very sad, you gain weight much easier than you should, you feel constipated, you don't feel good. So it's, it, it can affect your thyroid as well as your parathyroid gland, also in the neck, which regulates calcium, and calcium is needed for our bone health. Reproductive hormones can be affected. Uh, male and female uh, can have menstrual irregularities as well as affecting uh, pregnancy, which I'll talk about a little later. In males, this can affect testosterone with hypogonadism. Uh, just so to mention, DM1 and DM2 do have many features in common, uh, such as the myotonia, weakness, early cataracts, can have cardiac involvement and endocrine involvement. But one thing that sets them apart uh, is the central nervous system involvement. In myotonic dystrophy type 1, there tends to be a problem with thinking in some people, and it's not a dementia, but it's more of what we call problem with executive functioning, problems with organizing, planning, attention. 
this is not seen in DM2. However, when MRI of the brain has been done in both populations, changes are seen in both populations in what's called the deep white matter, but to a greater degree in patients with type 1. So how do you get myotonic dystrophy? As noted, it's an inherited condition. It runs in the family. And it's considered autosomal dominant, meaning that you inherit this condition from one parent. Both parents don't need to have it to pass it on to the child. And each child of an affected person has a 50% chance of getting myotonic dystrophy. This is a picture of a family tree or a pedigree. And you can see the circle is female, the male is a square. And someone who's affected with a condition, it's shaded in red here. And in each generation, someone is affected with this condition. And that's what it would look like in an autosomal dominant pattern. So just to go into a little more, more detail about inheritance. So this inherited disease is due to a mutation on a gene. And we have thousands. We have over 20,000 genes that determine who we are, our eye color, our hair color, our height. And we have two copies of each gene. We get one copy from each parent. And a gene is a big piece of DNA. And DNA, or deoxyribonucleic acid, uh, is our genetic code. And this code is made up of bases, or what we call nucleotides. And you can see the letters for each nucleotide, and we'll abbreviate it A, G, C, T. And we have these sequences in the DNA that are just continually being repeated, and in different orders, sometimes A, G, C, C, A, T. And I want you to keep that in mind. So as I said, in myotonic dystrophy, there's a mutation on one gene. And you can see that in this picture, a gene is a piece of DNA. And the genes are carried on chromosomes that squiggly stuff on that X. So there's a lot of genes on each chromosome. And these are all located within the nucleus of the cell. And we have 23 pairs of these chromosomes. We inherit one set of chromosomes from each parent, so half from mother, half from father. And uh, these are pair 23 pairs of chromosomes. And I'm just showing here in blue at the bottom is the uh, mutation for myotonic dystrophy type 1 is on chromosome 19. So one of the pair uh, of chromosomes would have the abnormal gene uh, for DMPK. And with DM2, it's due to a mutation on chromosome 3 up in red. And one of the pair uh, would have the mutation on the, on the uh, CNBP gene. And again, the DNA is inside the nucleus. So these disorders, myotonic dystrophy type 1 and type 2, have been called repeat expansion disorders. And what that means is those letters that we were talking about before, the nucleotides, the CTG is a trinucleotide. There's three nucleotides. They're repeated over and over and over, which exceeds the normal range. And that is because of a mutation on the DMPK gene. And in myotonic dystrophy type 2, there's a different mutation on a different gene, which causes four of those uh, nucleotides to repeat. And that one is a CCTG, what we call tetranucleotide, because of four, four of those. And I'll show you what that looks like. So in myotonic dy dystrophy type 1, there is an expansion of a repeating sequence of DNA. So it's CTG, CTG, CTG. And if one has 37 or less CTG repeats, they do not have myotonic dystrophy. They will not develop it, and they won't pass it on. If they have 37 to 49, they're affected, but they usually don't show any symptoms, and they could pass on the condition. Uh, 50 to 150, mild symptoms. 150 to 1,000, this is a most likely classic adult myotonic dystrophy. And in those who have over 1,000 repeats, 1,000 to 2,000, they usually present early with congenital or childhood onset. So you can see with the larger repeat size, there's earlier onset of disease, as well as increased severity with the increased repeat size. And why do different members of the family have different size repeats? Well, one of the reasons is because of something we call genetic anticipation. And the CTG repeat can expand 
from one generation to the next. And when it expands and gets larger from one generation to the next, symptoms will be earlier. So with anticipation, we have earlier onset of symptoms with each successive generation. Again, here's another family tree, and the square on top uh, is a male in red with 79 CTG repeats. He has three children, and one of his daughters, the one in red, has 244 repeats. There's been an expansion. And then she has uh, three children, and her daughter has 1,300 repeats. So that's an example of anticipation with expansion of that repeat getting larger from one generation to the next. And what does that look like? Well, this is a picture uh, from Harper showing three generations of a family with myotonic dystrophy type 1. Uh, the woman uh, on the left is 64 and has been described as just having cataracts unaware of having any other symptoms. Her daughter uh, uh, had cataracts as well, uh, much younger, and she uh, noticed during pregnancy that she had stiffness and was noted to have some atrophy of her hands. She had a child who had severe uh, weakness, congenital myotonic dystrophy, and I think you can appreciate the facial weakness. So this is uh, three generations showing anticipation with myotonic dystrophy type 1 due to an expansion of that repeat. Now in myotonic dystrophy type 2, uh, there's a different repeat, it's CCTG, and this repeat can be uh, in affected people from 75 to 11,000, which is a huge number. But in this condition, the repeat size does not seem to correlate with earlier onset of symptoms or severity of symptoms. And to date, there are no congenital cases of myotonic dystrophy type 2. So why do these repeats cause disease? So we're going back to the DNA. As you recall, there were those letters, those nucleotides, and there's different sequences. The DNA, those double strands there in the picture, is copied, or what we call transcribed, into a single strand of RNA. And in the process, the RNA is kind of cut up and pasted, and we call this splicing. And then the, DN, excuse me, then the RNA uh, travels out of the nucleus uh, and is translated into proteins. And these proteins are needed for all of our vital functions. So what happens in myotonic dystrophy? So how do these CTG repeats cause disease? Well, uh, the major hypothesis is that the CTG repeats are very disruptive, and they cause a toxic RNA. Uh, it causes the RNA to be retained in the nucleus. They literally get stuck, and they become toxic. So uh, this toxic RNA binds up with other proteins, and some of these, pro <laughs> some of these proteins are um, what I described as these splice regulators, and does not allow the RNA transcripts to be translated or to go out of the nucleus. They literally get stuck in the nucleus. And this can lead to many of the clinical uh, symptoms we see in myotonic dystrophy, such as insulin resistance, myotonia, and uh, impairs uh, the development of a heart and uh, muscle. So how do I know if I have myotonic dystrophy? Well, as I said, it runs in families. You can have a clinical suspicion. Uh, your doctor may have a clinical suspicion, but it's a personal decision whether or not you're going to have genetic testing. But if you do, it's strongly recommended that you have genetic counseling. Because uh, if you do have a positive test, it's going to impact you as well as other members of your family. If you're the first one to be diagnosed in your family, most likely one of your parents has myotonic dystrophy. They'll need to have surveillance. Your siblings probably will uh, need to uh, find out if they might be affected, as well as passing it on to your children. The way you're tested is through a blood test, looking for that uh, DNA repeat expansion, and that will confirm the genetic diagnosis. So when you go to the clinic, when you go to your checkup, what kind of questions uh, would be helpful? Well, I'd first uh, r consider writing your questions down. Uh, sometimes when you go to the doctor visits, it can be very distracting. People are coming in another room. So if you have things written down, it's helpful, especially if some of the questions uh, are embarrassing, have to do with your GI tract, or falling asleep at the wheel. Uh, it may be helpful uh, just to have something that you can look at that's written down. I'd also recommend 
bringing another family member, if possible, another set of ears or another person, uh, just to help you absorb all of the medical information. It's helpful if you bring your current medicines, make sure that they're compatible with myotonic dystrophy, uh, as well as bring names of your doctors, provider information. Now, in some centers, not all of your doctors are located in the same place, so it's very helpful to know who is your cardiologist, uh, who is your primary doctor, so that your doctors can work as a team. Other things to ask at your visit. Uh, do I need to see the cardiologist? Yes, you should see the cardiologist every year. You should have an EKG every year. And in some health plans, you actually need to get a referral. So make sure that that's in place so you can see the cardiologist every year. You should be seeing an eye doctor regularly to monitor for cataracts. And hopefully you won't need to go to the emergency room. But if that is the case, it's really important to have um, medical information on you. If you're unable to talk, uh, Perhaps you could have something, uh, a bracelet or a necklace or something in your wallet so people know you have myotonic dystrophy and this will help your, your health care providers in the emergency setting. Talk about your symptoms at the visit. Try to talk about these uh, uh, as much as you can so that uh, th there are a lot of treatments. And, and I said cardiac symptoms aren't always chest pain, dizziness, lightheadedness, uh, fainting, and this can be life-threatening if you have an abnormal heart rhythm. You may require a pacemaker or even a defibrillator. Constipation, abdominal pain is common, and this can be treated with medication and diet. A lot of patients uh, have difficulty with walking. The foot drop may cause um, them to feel imbalanced or as if they're going to trip. And some, uh, some treatments include braces to stabilize your ankles as well as physical therapy uh, so that you can maintain independent. Some special situations in myotonic dystrophy, I wanted to just talk briefly about pregnancy. Some uh, women will notice uh, that they, their myotonic dystrophy symptoms or they get weaker during pregnancy or even begin during pregnancy. And uh, there can be increased risk of complications in women uh, with myotonic dystrophy, including an increased rate of spontaneous abortions, more fluid, uh, ectopic pregnancies, placenta previa, and preterm labor. Uh, preterm labor can also be uh, increased uh, in women with DM2 uh, as well as UTIs. So the recommendation for pregnant women with myotonic dystrophy is to have close obstetric monitoring and to deliver in a facility that has full perinatal services. One last special situation in myotonic dystrophy. If you need to have surgery or procedure, say a colonoscopy, it's really important that you let your doctor know uh, who's going to do the procedure that you have myotonic dystrophy. Uh, because patients with myotonic dystrophy type 1 are especially sensitive to anesthesia and can have exaggerated responses which can affect breathing, coughing, swallowing. Uh, so the recommendation is to prefer local, if possible, rather than general anesthesia. And in the post-operative uh, period after surgery, very close monitoring. These recommendations are actually on the uh, Myotonic Dystrophy Foundation website. Uh, and it's a one-page summary. I have a copy of it if you want to see it, but it's something easy you can uh, print and just give to your doctor. This website, Myotonic Dystrophy Foundation, is a wonderful website, has a wonderful toolkit, uh, a great resource. A lot of the information in my uh, talk is from that website. And this is kind of a busy slide. It's a study on patients with DM1 and DM2 in regard to anesthesia. And what it's showing, and it's uh, that yellow box, at, a yellow rectangle at the very bottom, responses to common um, anesthetics that are used uh, during surgery. And patients uh, with DM1, that's the first column, they have an increased sensitivity uh, to um, all of those common uh, medications, where patients with myotonic dystrophy type 2 truly had a normal response to the anesthesia. So in summary, uh, myotonic dystrophy is inherited condition. It's autosomal dominant from one parent. It's a multi-system disorder uh, with muscle weakness and myotonia, but can also affect the eyes. It can affect the heart, breathing, as well as endocrine system um, and the brain. 
Uh, myotonic dystrophy type 1 is due to a mutation on chromosome 19. Uh, the gene is called the DMK, excuse me, DMPK gene, and it's due to a CTG repeat expansion, and anticipation can occur with expansion of that repeat from one generation to the next with earlier onset of uh, the disease. DM2 is due to a different repeat, uh, CCTG, on a different gene on chromosome 3, the CNBP gene, and this is usually adult onset uh, and has a different distribution. It's usually more proximal shoulder and hip girdle. We believe the clinical features of myotonic dystrophy are a result of toxic RNA that gets stuck in the nucleus and is not translated into proteins. Uh, it's really recommended to have medical identification, either bracelet, necklace, or in your wallet in the case of an emergency. And regular monitoring is really key, having your eyes checked regularly, having an EKG at least every year, and seeing your cardiologist, just to promote the uh, highest quality of life. So I see some familiar faces out in the audience, and I really want to thank um, uh, the patients who have taught me so much about muscular dystrophy. But I truly want to thank the Stanford team, especially Jennifer Fisher, Jennifer Fisher, are you in the back there? She is uber organized and really detail oriented and she has done an incredible job uh, to make this possible. And uh, I also want to thank my colleagues from UCSD and Rady who have agreed to participate in the program today. And thank you very much. <laughs>